Brilliant. Hello, everybody. This is, uh, I'm Mike Ennis. I'm director of the Conflict Records Unit. This is part of our uh, speaker series. I have with me uh, Vincent Hirabaran, uh, who is an academic, a reader in African history at King's College London, and Marc-Antoine Perouse de Monclos, who's a political scientist, if I got that. That's accurate, a political scientist or an historian. Um, political scientist, yeah. Okay, political scientist, senior researcher at the Institut de Recherche pour le Développement. And they are going to be talking about recording violent events in Nigeria, specifically the case of the Nigeria Watch database, 2006 to the present. I'll just make a, offer a quick note and then I'll hand it over to our um, speaker and discussant and they will take it away. We'll have opportunity for uh, some Q&A towards the end. We'll be running for about 45, 50 minutes. Uh, if you are attending and you have any questions, please drop them into the, um, into the chat box, um, in, into the, the, the chat room, and I'll moderate that and, and we'll uh, take the questions from there, about five or 10 minutes at the end for, for Q&A. Um, so I, I met uh, Vincent about a year ago uh, when I was setting up the Conflict Records Unit, um, and I was, I was um, familiar with efforts to track violent events in Nigeria in the Lake Chad Basin area more broadly. Uh, but I had not heard of this particular database. I got quite excited in you know, a new database, uh, especially given the time frame associated with that database. This isn't a fad that popped up in the last couple of years. This has been something that's going on for quite a while. So I'm really looking forward to, uh, to hearing it and discussing with Vincent and Marc Antoine what, uh, what this project is and, and how they developed it, why they developed it, and, uh, and what use it, it's put to. So with that, uh, Vincent, Marc Antoine, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, Michael. Thank, thank, thank you for let me just correct the sound issue. Thank you for uh, hosting us today. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm actually a reader in history. I'm currently director of Nigeria, which is a French institute based at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. Thank you for having us. 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 Thank you which is not something which is supposed to be in the union based on the primary technology in Canada. Uh, it's something which uh, clearly uh, has, has a massive potential, potential for historians, for the scientists, anyone interested in violence in Nigeria. Um, and, I, I think, um, and I think that's, uh, that's something which will, uh, uh, which is really, the, for me as a historian, something which, well, the, 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 the the worth of this database. Um, one thing I like to stress as well here, not only do we talk about violence, but also we talk about you know, the, the information and the sources used uh, to, this, to talk about violence. And Nigeria Watch uses uh, uh, primary sources. I'm sure Mark Antoine will tell us more about it in, in, in a second. But you know, we can, for those who have access to the database, uh, you can uh, have access to the PDF, scanned press, newspapers, uh, used to uh, to gather numbers, document numbers for this on this violence. That's something which I find extremely interesting to discuss uh, violence over the last fifteen years in Nigeria. So you know, as a historical source, as a uh, as a database, as a project in what we call today digital humanities, I think that you know the, the project is extremely valuable. It's one of the old, oldest projects running at IFRA. That's why I'm very happy for. My content to be with us today as well, so that he can introduce uh, the database to us in a much uh, in a much like, better way than I would as a PI, as someone who's worked with different people in Nigeria, who's trying to debunk myths on violence in Nigeria as well. So that's why this database does very well. I will uh, ask questions later on in the discussion to Mark Antoine to show that how we can use the database uh, as a research tool. Uh, you know, not, not just as something which accumulate numbers, but something which can be a re real research tool. Uh, for us and uh, hope you enjoy it. So I think Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, I hope, I hope there, there is no echo cool. because I'm sitting uh, side by side with uh, Vincent. So is it all right? Yes. There's no echo? It's fine. All right. okay. Thank you. Good enough. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to, to all for uh, inviting me to this uh, session. Maybe before talking about methodology and some of the findings, I should say a word about the world concept. You see, uh, my first time in Nigeria was in 1988. And in the late 80s, people were already talking about rising violence. And next year, you will have another Biafra war, another civil war. 
on, of course, you have to distinguish between perceptions and what is objectable, you know, what, uh, what are the uh, hard facts when it comes to the measurement of violence, not only in, in Algeria, huh? this is a big issue in many, uh, in many countries. And even in France, for instance, uh, you have surveys people that show that people think that the country is now more violent. We had the uh, attack on uh, Charlie Hebdo, the Bataclan and so forth. And yet the homicide rate uh, in France has been divided by four since 1970. And people think, still think that uh, the country is more violent. Uh, we are now in Nigeria in 2021, and I hear exactly what I heard in, 90, in the 1980s, that is violence is on the rise, we're on the verge of a civil war and blah, 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 blah. So um, from when I was writing my PhD in the late 1980s, um, I was trying to find figures, the usual thing normally you go to the police, and see the statistics, but it was a military dictatorship. Dictatorship. They no longer published any annual police report. And I went to a place called the Louis Edet House, which is uh, in, in Lagos. And that was at this time the headquarters of the national police, uh, the police force in Nigeria. And it was a kind of cavern of Ali Baba, you know, bunch of papers everywhere reporting from uh, this local government or another one not compiled and you would see that the addition were wrong in these uh, papers. There was nothing to do with it. So basically, uh, we didn't know where the country was going. There was no data uh, based on evidence to see uh, if really Nigeria was becoming more violent in what region, was there any pattern, you know? And that's how it started uh, in the mid 2000s. Um, first in France, and then we had an opportunity, thanks to DFID that supported us, uh, to shift the database to um, IFRA here in Ibadan. And that makes sense because it's now run by um, four um, Nigerian, three uh, Nigerian scholars who are uh, every day working on retrieving data from open sources in the local press. Uh, and we used one indicator, which is indeed the body count of uh, violent incidents. Uh, that is. We are also part of uh, an international network, which is London-based. It's called Every Casualty Worldwide. Uh, it's a kind of NGO that um, link um, various body count practitioners all over the world, from Colombia to Pakistan, Somalia, etc. And they try, and it's really difficult, and we can have a word about it if you want, to um, uh, set up standards with the UN and the RCRC, uh, the International Red Cross, on how to count the victims of armed conflict. And there are many challenges, I must say. Um, and to try to sum up a long story, we decided really to focus only on lethal incidents that have only that have at least one uh, people killed, you know, uh, because we think it doesn't make sense, like some other databases do, to compare a non-lethal incident with the massacre of 300 peasants by the army or Boko Haram in the north. East. It really doesn't make sense to give them one unit, you know, one, one incident. That's usually what um, uh, private security firms do, uh, or also when it comes to piracy attacks, you know, whatever the number of people killed, they put one unit, one incident, so it says it's on the rise or not. And also a very important thing is that we use the same corpus since 2006, otherwise you might have a distortion, you know, the, the word is every day is getting more digitalized. So you have more information to aggregate in the database, which might just be related to the fact that you have more captors, more system, more, more, more people to report on incidents. So we use the same corpus since 2006, and we know we are not exhaustive at all. I mean, we're talking about a country of uh, 200 million people, approximately. Um, there's a census which is supposed to be done next year, but we're not sure it's going to happen. The last one was in 2006. And of course, we also to relate the number of um, people killed in violence compared to the growth of the population, because this does make sense. People tend to forget it. Uh, and again, the, um, the issue of the corpus is extremely important. We have gaps, and we actually investigated this gap, geographical gap. To put it a bit, uh, uh, I mean, I, I'm a bit provocative, maybe. I would say that all our figures are wrong but they are wrong the same way from one year to another and one region to another, because we rely on the Nigerian press, and which is more in the south as compared to the north. So out of 774 local governments, uh, we realized after a few years when we started that we had 
35, 40 local governments, local governments with no fatalities recorded and reported ever. So there were two hypotheses, whether you had Switzerland in Nigeria or you had some rural local governments that were simply not reported. So uh, thanks to the uh, NSRP, the, the DFID, we could uh, give grants to Nigerian scholars who did the field work. And obviously, we found that they were unreported uh, little violence. So we are quite aware of this challenge. This is one of our challenge, but we know that when violence is on the rise, with all the gaps we have, then yes, we know that something is going on. Because we try to avoid the distortion of, you know, the more data, the more the more sources you add up and the more violence you would report, you know, you would record. So we try to avoid this by this, um, by sticking to the uh, corpus, the same corpus as the one we started in 2006. Another challenge we have is about the coding. Um, and we are not very comfortable with some of the database that claim to deal only with so-called political violence, because it's very difficult to debunk what is political as compared to criminal uh, ordinary uh, violence. And usually we have several causes for each little incident, you know. Um, it might be reported by some uh, articles as being criminal, uh, motivated by crime. Uh, some others would say it's political, religious, ethnic, or whatever. So many times we have several causes. Um, and we also use different sources whenever we have access to different sources. Uh, that usually give uh, different figures of number of victims. So we, then we uh, make an average to have an idea because what we are really interested in are the trends. So uh, it really depends on you. Uh, would you like me to say a word about the indicator we choose or some of the findings? It's really up to you. Tell me. Uh, I think all of those things are of interest. I can't I mean, hear you. It's... Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd say all of those things are interesting. We have a bit of time. Vincent, your discussant, it's up to you. If there's time for Malcolm Antoine to Let, continue. Let's go for indicators first. Yeah, yes, please. please. All right. Mm. So why focusing on uh, the body count only? Uh, because it, it's also a matter of philosophy in a way. We, uh, uh, we believe that uh, all human life counts. So uh, when somebody is killed, it can be compared with any other one, any other victim that has been killed. It's much more difficult to compare uh, someone who has been injured, uh, difficult to compare them and consider them to be equal. So we stick to the kind of ANC slogan, you know, whereby uh, one man, one vote, you know. Um, so uh, we think it makes sense. And most of the body count practitioners also uh, do it this way, you know. Um, CIPRI, um, uh, our colleagues and uh, partners in um, every casualty worldwide are indeed focusing on the body count as the, the, the entry to record violence to make sense to compare, you know. Uh, and also because the definition of crime from one country to another, I mean, to record criminal act as the, so now you have a police annual report in Nigeria, you know, the, the military dictatorship is finished. Actually, it's not really the police that produce it because they are not interested in statistics at all. It's a foundation supported by USAID. It's called Clean Foundation in Lagos. They are actually the one producing the police annual report, but they record criminal acts, basically, uh, sometimes kidnappings, sometimes homicides. Um, but the problem with criminal act is that the definition is not the same from one region to another, not to talk about one country to another. Let's say, let's say that the definition of rape uh, in, in Saudi Arabia is a bit different from the one in, in, in Norway. And there can be some uh, discrepancies also. Um, for instance, uh, Interpol stopped publishing in 2006 uh, a report about international uh, comparison of uh, crime rates from one country or to the other, precisely because of this problem of definition, you know. Um, and it appeared, for instance, that the most criminal uh, uh, country in Europe was uh, Netherlands because of uh, theft of bicycles uh, and because people insure their bicycles, so they report to the police whenever their bicycles are uh, stolen which is not the case. Um, I had three bicycles stolen in Paris and I never reported to the police because it's completely useless. And uh, we don't have this culture of insurance of bicycle in France, which might explain why some uh, acts are reported and not others. So because of all this challenge, 
uh, Interpol stopped publish uh, statistics, international statistics on crime rates. And even within Algeria, the defini definition of crime, uh, a bit like in the US, you know, uh, can be a bit different from one state to another. We are talking about a federation of 36 states and 12 states in the north do are supposed to implement and apply Sharia even if they don't really do so, but anyway. And according to Sharia, for instance, adultery would be condemned by the death penalty. Uh, actually, it never really happened because then you have a system uh, where you can resort to uh, so-called uh, secular uh, courts that would actually uh, cancel the sentence by Sharia courts. But theoretic, theoretically, um, if you are in the North and you are a Muslim, not a Christian, then Sharia law would apply. And if you commit adultery, you could face a death penalty. And this is not the case in Southern Nigeria, which is more dominated by uh, Christians. So if you commit adultery, maybe your pastor or your uh, bishop will come to you and blame you. You're not a good Christian and so on, but it's not considered as a, as a criminal act. So you see, even within a federation like Nigeria, the definition of criminal act is very difficult to uh, implement whenever you try to, to code and measure violence. So that's some of the reasons why we decided to focus only on the, on the body count and little incidents. We think it makes more, uh, more sense. Uh, yeah. So now I have a question about the research findings. Yeah. It's like, you know, what, for example, uh, you recently done a study on NSAS. NSAS was a movement against uh, police body called SARS, which started in 2017, but which became, uh, there was a second wave of the movement in 2020, nearly a year ago, actually, and the anniversary date is on the 20th of October 2021. Uh, so a year ago, there were, there were shootings in Lagos and there were demonstrations in some parts of the country. Uh, so what does the database tell us about such, uh, you know, such achievements? Yes, thank you. Uh, we have many interesting findings, and the older we are, of course, the, the more uh, the less discrepancy we have in the in the findings because uh, long trends do confirm uh, what we found. And one of the extraordinary findings, I would say, or maybe it shouldn't be that surprising, but it just confirmed that the um, the security forces, security and defense forces, are masculine in Nigeria, and even uh, in the case of Boko Haram in the northeast. Uh, we realized that government forces, that is the army, the police, the air force, uh, the uh, GSS, that is the secret service or the prison or custom service and the governmental militia are killing more than Boko Haram, for instance, which speaks volume when it comes to the issue of reconciliation, to ending the conflict and so forth. So we realized that Boko Haram or not, um, since we started in 2006, uh, the incidents where the police shoot and kill or the army shoot and kill, the rate of lethal incident where the police or the army intervene and do kill people is absolutely amazing. It's an average of 50%. I'm just trying to, to, to sum up, but in some years for the army it could be as much as 80%. That means that in 80% of lethal incident where the army intervene, they would kill. Actually, there's one unit of the police, it's called MOPOL, the mobile police, and in Pidgin in Nigeria, they call it kill and go. And kill and go tells you uh, what, what, what it means. I mean, they, they, they kill and they, and they go. So extrajudicial killings are really part of the system. Um, it's, I don't believe it's part of um, genocide enterprise or the government which would try to wipe out one community. It's just business as usual, and there's total impunity in this regard. It's a way of um, maintaining law and order, kind of. Uh, the government is not that in such a good position to actually um, stop this uh, system, uh, especially uh, now. Uh, and what we realize also is that there, there are differences when it comes to the army or the police. Let's say that the army, of course, uh, is more uh, is better equipped with uh, war weapons than the army, than the police, sorry. So whenever they uh, kill on, they shoot on kill, they kill more people at the same time. Whereas the police is less equipped uh, with heavy equipment, uh, and, but they kill more often, uh, but they kill less people at the same time. But all in all, we really have a structural problem 
And it appeared clearly uh, last year with the NSARS protest against police brutality. But funny enough, uh, it's not funny actually, it's strangely enough, uh, the protests were focused in southern states, especially big cities like Lagos, uh, a bit of Wari where it started in Delta State, uh, but not much in the north. And yet with the war on terror against Boko Haram, most of the extrajudicial killings, most of the mass human rights violations are in the Northeast. And actually we are presenting a paper uh, very soon in, in Abuja with a project called Managing Conflict in Nigeria under the U EU about this, you know, why there was no NSARS protest uh, in the Northeast in 2020 when it was focused in the South and yet mass human rights violations are many in the, North, um, in the Northeast. And again, what was surprising, and we could not really explain that, we can explain why it did not happen in the Northeast, but that's really uh, another debate. Uh, but we can't explain why NSAS protests started in 2020. It could have happened in 2019, in 2018. I mean, police brutality was there already. Uh, but then there was a trigger with the social media uh, showing a man being uh, killed uh, while the police stole his car, actually, his, his SUV uh, in Delta State. Uh, but that could have happened any year since we started this uh, database. And we don't really have an explanation on why it took so much time in 2020 to start this protest against police brutality. Historically, in the 1980s, there were already protests, especially in university campus against police brutality. But to no avail, it never really changed the system. You know, the, the, the government decided to um, disband SARS, which means the Special Anti-Robbery Squad. Uh, it's called the Crack Squad in the Northeast. They disbanded it, but they didn't stop impunity. So um, it will be interesting to see if the NSARS protest changed anything. Mm, my guess would be that no, I didn't really change this system of uh, extrajudicial killings uh, on a daily basis. Uh, with total impunity. Let me ask you a question about the Northeast. You mentioned the Northeast recently. For those who don't know, Northeast Nigeria, we've got the region of Borno, which uh, became famous for harboring Boko Haram. And Boko Haram became famous, uh, as you internationally speaking. And what does your database show, actually, about you know violence uh, in the Northeast and the conflict, the whole conflict? Actually, Boko Haram started uh, with an extrajudicial killing, you know, the extrajudicial killing of Mohammed Yusuf. Um, so this sect, it was, it started as a sect, Islamist, Islamist sect, very radical and its species, but it was up to 2009, up to the uh, emergency of 2009, it was not banned, it was legal. They had a mosque in Maiduguri, they had time to preach, they had airtime on the Bono regional television. So it was not a terrorist clandestine group. And what happened is that, uh, that's another finding, by the way, of Nigeria Watch, your main risk as a Nigerian or an expat to be killed in Nigeria is due to road accidents. And it's under the radar. I mean, nobody really pay attention to that, but it kills more than terrorism than anything you want. Uh, and actually some of the Boko Haram members at this time in 2009 died in a car accident uh, on a road in Bauchi. And they wanted to bury them in Bono, uh, Bono State, uh, whose capital is my degree. And then they were shot at by the police because they were turbans. It's, it's a complex story, but to, to, to make a long story short, that's how it started. Then um, Mohammed Yusuf wanted to avenge uh, the people who had died out of the, uh, this uh, shooting. At the beginning, they were uh, treated, but then some of them died from what we understand. And then he, he launched jihad, you know, he proclaimed jihad against uh, the government and they went on a rampage in Maiduguri that was in July, 2009. And then the police, the army caught Mohamed Yusuf and handed him to the police uh, to be tried. And then the police extrajudicially killed him because some of his supporters had actually how could I say it gently? They dismantled the body of the chief of the Mopol, you know, the mobile police in, uh, in Nigeria. They really cut him into pieces. So they wanted to get revenge. So they killed him. Uh, Mohamed Yusuf was never tried. And then the, the group became underground under uh, Shekau. I'm sure you know of him. Uh, you know, he, he was the one who kidnapped the Shibok girls. 
and then the group became extremely violent and started a terrorist operation, terrorist attacks in Abuja and elsewhere against the headquarters of the national police. And they started also to attack Christians, which was not the case before. Uh, so that's how it, uh, it started. And there was a peak in 2014. Um, if you look at the data, it's online. Uh, you don't need a, a password to get very rough uh, data. If you look at the trends, you would see there was a peak in 2014 in Nigeria. Uh, and <clears throat> that was because of the Boko Haram conflict, because there was a state of emergency. An emergency, emergency rule was put in place in 2013. And for the first time, the army would go out of cities and start to bomb uh, uh, villages uh, in rural areas. So the, the killings were enormous in 2013 and 2014 on, on both sides. And when Muhammad Bari, who is a Muslim, uh, the current president was elected in 2015, it decreased a lot. I don't think I have written papers on that. I assume it's not because the army performed better, but because there was more trust by civilians to support the war on terror, because Muhammad Bari was a Muslim. So it declined. And now, actually, uh, the level is quite low when it comes to uh, fatal incidents related to Boko Haram only. Uh, but we have another issue, uh, which has to do with rural banditry. But again, it's very difficult to separate what is really related to Boko Haram or to banditry. And this brings us back to one of the issues I mentioned on other databases, some of them very known. Let me, nom let me not give names, but anyway, you, you will see who I'm talking about. I presume you will guess. And they uh, claim to be working only on political violence, but it's we, we don't have the capacity to investigate on the field. We are not a police organization. So we just deal with reports as violence was reported. And you know, you can, you can have distortion. And I, can, I could give you examples of such uh, a distortion, maybe later when we carry on this uh, conversation, but maybe there are some questions, I don't know, yeah. Um, actually, I, I have a, a couple uh, of questions, questions if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, we, had, we had conversations about uh, gender violence, especially this morning actually, how this data, the database reports uh, uh, homicides and femicides in general and how women are being killed. The Nigerian press, press tends to report uh, men being killed by women uh, in a disproportionate way. Uh, what can you tell us a bit more about this, please? Actually, we, we are working on it, so I, I don't have much to it, but uh, much to it to, uh, to add to this uh, issue. But we presume that indeed there is a tendency by the Nigerian press to overreport uh, men being killed by their wife and not to report as much uh, wives being killed by their husband. You know. Uh, but let me give you uh, an example of distortion we properly investigated. Uh, it was the case of the OPC, which was an ethnic Yoruba militia uh, operating in Lagos at the beginning of the 2000s, even before we started the, um, the database. And I was doing field work there, and I could see very much that the press, the press in Lagos, so OPC stands for the Odua People's Congress. And Odudua is supposedly the ancestor of the Yoruba nation, as they claim to be. And there was claims for separatism, you know, form of autonomy, and it was quite uh, ethnic driven. They uh, attacked uh, non-Yoruba residents in Lagos, which is the biggest city in, in Nigeria and the economic capital city. So they would attack the Ijo, the uh, Ibo, the uh, Hausa and so forth everybody who was not Yoruba. And what we realized is the, 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 the journalists in, in newspapers like Vanguard or Punch, which are very much Yoruba, uh, would consider them as freedom fighters. Whereas the Guardian, uh, there is a, a Guardian in Lagos, another paper who is owned by somebody from Edo State, not a Yoruba, uh, would treat them as just sheer criminals, you know. And it, it just speaks volume about the, the way um, uh, violence can be reported, you know. Some people are inclined for sympathy for some of the armed groups. The same with, for instance, MEND uh, in the Niger Delta, the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta. They are called militants, not terrorists. I don't really know why, because they put car bombs uh, in Eagle Square uh, during the 15th uh, anniversary of the uh, independence of Nigeria in 2010, and they killed dozens of people with these car bombs. They also uh, organized terrorist attacks in Wari City. So uh, yet they are named militants, but 
the press really agree on Boko Haram being framed as a terrorist group. There's quite a consensus, but I think it has also to do with these perceptions, you know. Uh, so again, the way violence is reported will impact much on the way uh, the database will frame uh, violence. But as I said before, we have several coding, you know, uh, and if we use, for instance, we have one very important uh, newspaper in the north called Daily Trust. It's actually the, almost the only daily paper in the north. And of course, the way they frame violence, the way they report it is completely different from the southern press, especially in Lagos. So again, we have multiple coding and very often what we have is a fatal incident, which is both reported as being political and criminal. There is actually a distortion in all Nigeria, the way people talk about pastoralism, mm -hmm. you know, uh, for, for our listeners today, for the audience, we just, there's a whole Sahel, there's supposed to be a competition between uh, pastoralists and farmers. Um, I'm saying it's supposed to be because actually the way it's framed in different national presses, different newspapers around, you know, in Africa, tends to be quite different. But what was it like in your database? How does it appear, basically? Yes, the, there is an anti-Fulani um, trend actually uh, currently in the, in the Nigerian press. Now, I had a suspicion, I can't prove it, it's just a suspicion that whenever Muhammad Bouhari, who is um, a president, a Fulani president elected from the north, came to power in 2015, the press in the south uh, wanted, you know, Bouhari was elected as the former military dictator who can end up the Boko Haram uprising. And he made his electoral campaign was very much focused on his predecessor, Gulag Jonathan, who was a Christian from the South, who was seen as incompetent, incapable to finish off uh, Boko Haram. So it was a campaign very much focused on the incapacity of the federal government at this time to uh, uh, contain the Boko Haram, the terrorist uh, threat. And I think that from 2015, uh, because what we know from historians is that these stories of rural banditry are very old, they are not new, but I think there was also maybe um, a kind of distortion that it became more visible precisely because it was used as um, a way to show that Buari was also as incompetent as his predecessor, but this time to fight Boko Haram or to contain uh, rural banditry. Let me give you, and, and this brings us also to a very important point, and I'm sure that uh, Vincent, who is a historian, and I really believe in uh, the importance of history, would, would quite agree with me. But it also shows that all our figures are really useless if you don't combine it with qualitative research. I come from a qualitative world, you know, I'm not a statistician, I'm a political scientist, the French way, not the American way, I'm not into Excel and all these data thing. I mean, this is really, uh, and I believe that uh, the, the, the questions, the, the way you frame your questions when you try to uh, get figures from the database are extremely important and they can uh, actually determine the results, your findings. So you need, you need field work. This is absolutely uh, fundamental. And what historians have shown in northern Nigeria and also northern, Bo northern Cameroon, uh, which prolongs northern Nigeria uh, towards the region of Lake Chad, and I'm thinking to one of my, my colleague in Cameroon who published some splendid studies in this regard, Maybe several, several lessons to be learned. Number one, um, you have a lot of infighting between various Fulani cattle breeders. And this is always, this is very often um, obscured by the narratives focusing on the clash of civilization between Muslim cattle breeders against Christian, uh, Christian um, uh, 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 peasants, uh, cultivators farmers and actually this does happen yes especially in the middle belt of Nigeria uh, in Plas Plateau State for instance but that's not the end of the story uh, one you have a lot of also uh, violent uh, confrontation between farmers uh, you have to know also that most of the cattle now is bred by farmers no longer by transhuman. This is disappearing. This is the old tradition in Africa, but most of the cattle is now bred by um, bred by by um, by, um, by farmers, um, agro pastoral uh, farms, for instance. Uh, so we should not forget about these conflicts also. Uh, and the other lesson had to do with the way, for instance, kidnappings developed in northern Nigeria. 
and we can date it back to the uh, introduction, the development of banks in rural areas. And uh, I believe maybe some of you would agree that uh, if there's a blame always, it should be on banks. And when they developed during the oil boom in the 1970s, uh, actually, there was already a lot of rural banditry, but uh, cattle breeders would go to fairs, they would sell their cattle, and they, bring, they would bring a lot of cash back home, and they were attacked on the road by bandits. But when these banks developed, they would put the cash in the bank, and then they had very little cash with them when they, would, when, 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 when they would travel back home. And so bandits started to kidnap their kids, you know, to get a ransom from them. So uh, kidnapping uh, is not uh, a new phenomenon at all in this region of the world, uh, except that, of course, the Shibok affairs that have involved a lot of money have shown a kind of business model whereby, indeed, uh, young kids in school, girls or boys have a value. You know, they can be marketed and before uh, bandits would not know it. So now, indeed, the, um, the, the, the kidnappings in the Northwest, Northwest uh, whatever the political condition for uh, reporting these events are apparently indeed on the, on the rise. Uh, yes. Well. well, for those who are interested in what just uh, Mark Antoine mentioned before, is the mix of qualitative and quantitative uh, analysis. You've got a link in the chat you'd be interested in. It's a publication by Mark Antoine uh, from 2016 called Violence in Nigeria. Uh, it's an edited collection. So uh, why am I mentioning this? It's in the chat right now. It's because actually, oh, there it is. Yeah, it's just a chat slide. <laughs> um, it, you've got a link as well there. It's an open access book. Um, it's, it's a very important one for, for lots of reasons. Uh, one, which is quite important as well, is that Mark Anton works with Nigerian scholars. You know, it's a collaboration. It's not just something which uh, kind of comes out of nowhere. And he's working with lots of you know researchers here in Ibadan, but also in the rest of Nigeria, and that's you know something which is uh, worth mentioning. And two is that you know here you can see how his uh, methodology can be used, you know, uh, to really uh, just uh, have proper research conclusions. So it's not just you know a very kind of positivist approach to numbers, as Mark Anton just mentioned before. It's something that he wants to ask questions, you know, based on uh, on this on these figures. And I think that this book in particular. Uh, I've, reached, I've read nearly all the chapters now, not all of them, but nearly all of them. <laughs> so you know, I think this book in particular shows the potential uh, of the database in particular. If you're looking for something a bit more, um, a bit more like, you know, faster to read, uh, there's also a leaflet called 10 Myths on Violence in Nigeria. And it's something that Mark Anton alluded to just in his, in his, you know, in his fascinating answer to, to the question is that Somehow, um, there are lots of myths on violence in Nigeria. You know, it's like Nigeria, Colombia. You know, that country, it's supposed to be a country where everything's violent. I mean, everything is like you know, fire and you know, just uh, yeah, just so there you go as well. Specific answers based on uh, reasoned usage of the figures obtained by the database, and I think that that's where as well. You know, quite like uh, and this kind of it, it's uh, you've got a PDF in this last link. You can download a PDF and there you can go access to just very clear conclusions. Uh, I really like it. I give it to my own students you know, in London when I'm there to, you know, so for them to, to read this, to, to know that it's something which goes beyond you know, cliches and stereotypes uh, on violence in uh, certain sub Saharan countries or uh, poor countries in general, you know, just, uh, just like that as well. But something which I think is very, very worthwhile. Uh, I wanted to end my own, you know, uh, chat by this, but I wanted to, to show as well that how we can mix this kind of two approaches. How Mark also mentioned to manage all of this, and I think that's why I liked it. You know, I like the other database a lot, and I wanted to carry on for a long while now. Uh, I can see we've got questions already in the yeah. chat. Um, one question by uh, Shunko Liv, who's an MA student in the Water City Department. Uh, Mark Antoine, the question is. Uh, uh, the way you can differentiate between drug based violence and political violence uh, because of the importance of drug cartels in Nigeria and uh, supposedly maybe in some groups. Um, do you want to answer this question in particular? And after we can open the floor to other questions. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Yes, thank you for the question. Actually, we don't really differentiate. I mean, it really depends on the way it's reported. And very often you would have a, a little incident that would be coded as being both criminal and political, uh, especially if some uh, political godfathers, as we say in Nigeria, are involved. So that's the way we would uh, sort it out. Uh, to be frank, from 
what I know from what I remember, we don't have much incident uh, related to drug violence as such. It's, they are not reported for some reasons. I don't know. Um, and um, as for Boko Haram being involved in drug trafficking, I'm extremely skeptical on this uh, dominant narrative. Uh, it happened in Mali. We have evidence, you know, there was a, a plane uh, carrying drugs from Colombia, but there was no such thing in, uh, in, in, in Northeast Nigeria. And actually, if I was uh, the head of a drug cartel uh, today, uh, number one, I would earn much more money as with research compared to research. And number two, I wouldn't be stupid enough to, uh, to, to transit uh, drug through Borno state. I mean, that's, it's a war area. I mean, it's, it's, it, you have to, to dash, as we say in Algeria, you know, to bribe people to pass checkpoints. I mean, I wouldn't use this route. No way, it doesn't make sense. And that's not where you produce drugs. Uh, of course, we should distinguish between imported drugs, uh, marijuana, which is produced in the South of Nigeria. And I published a very long time ago, some kind of uh, history of drug traffickers in Nigeria. And it really started in the South, not in the North. Uh, it involved a lot the military uh, because they had facilities to, to travel. And even when it comes to fake medicine, uh, the laboratories are in the Southeast, not in the Northeast. Uh, and Tramadol, which is a drug that was used by Shekau and others, um, probably just to relieve their pain because most, a good number of their combatants have been injured, uh, was, was kind, of, kind of imported from the Southeast. That's not in the North, it's not produced in the Northeast. So I am quite challenging the idea that Boko Haram is funded by drug trafficking. Uh, we don't have any, any evidence and, and drug trafficking. You have drunk people who consume drugs in the Northeast, but that's not where it's produced. And the dealers are not, I mean, you've got petty dealers uh, who are usually Igbo from the Southeast and who live in the Northeast and they sell drugs. But again, uh, the drug uh, barons are not there. That's not where it happens. Yeah. And now we've got two questions on methodology by Michael. The first one is about distortions. Uh, how do you how do you verify information drawn from Nigerian press? And, and the second, second one is that I guess the fact uh, I think Michael was mentioned talking about about internet. I suppose you know the fact we've got more more and more sources of the types of media in general. So that's yes. Um, yeah, we can't verify information drawn from Nigerian press. We are talking about we are we are a team of there are three Nigerian um, documentalists. Um, uh, that are working every day uh, on this issue. We're talking about a country of 200 million people. So obviously we don't have the capacity to make any investigation and verify. So what we do, we can't cross check, but again, we take uh, several uh, contradictory sources for the same incident whenever these sources are available, because sometimes we have only one source, so we cannot balance, you know, and uh, this cross checking with these different resources would, probably take us to have different coding uh, in the cause of the, of, the, of the violence and have different figures on the number of fatalities. And then we take the average, uh, basically, of, uh, of fatalities. That's how we try to cross-check, to balance uh, the sources. Uh, but again, we don't have the capacity, and I don't think anyone has, uh, not even the Nigeria police, to investigate all the cases that are reported in the press. That would be absolutely uh, enormous. As for, okay, how do we cope with increased volume types of media output? Again, it's very important for us to stick to our corpus because it, it kind of, it does not eliminate the uh, discrepancies, but we can, uh, we know the discrepancies. Uh, you know where, we know where it happens, but if you add up more uh, sources uh, while it's ongoing, then automatically uh, violence would be on the rise. And it's, it's a problem that is well known by criminologists. You know, the more cops you have, the more police you have in, in the streets, patrolling the streets, the more crime you have because the more crime they can report. Uh, so it's, it's, it's quite a challenge. That's why we think it's very important not to, re not to rely on social media. Um, can, you know, it, it could be, um, anything could be reported there. 
We're not saying that journalists are doing a better job when it's printed press, uh, but at least we know where the gaps are. We know where the dis discrepancies are. So we, we rely on these mistakes to try to make something up out of it. And cross-checking, investigating all these cases is, to me, simply impossible. Can you hear me? Are there any other questions? Can you hear me? Okay, um, I've got I've got one or two questions for you. I, I was uh, holding back from from speaking too much because you had some really good flow going, um, and also um, you know sometimes the audio is a bit unreliable. Um, I think that's a really interesting point to sort of more or less close on the value of a reliable and consistent methodology, and that's really interesting. It's 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 kind of a no-brainer. It's a classic sort of antidote to how do you deal with the volume of information and kinds of information that are available to you. And the temptation is always there to grab more of it and try to make sense of more of it. And it's kind of a, a conundrum that, you know, all sorts of entities try to deal with. Because the information is there, they should, of course, try to use it um, by excluding some, by making some choices uh, and being transparent and and uh, and uh, consistent about that, you can have findings that maybe or data that might be useless, but findings that are reliable nonetheless, uh, in a sense. And that might sound a little bit confusing, but I get it um, entirely. You've made a m much better case of it than my my summary. Um, I guess my my question for you, if you want to drop the link for the um, for the database, and again just to refresh that for attendees, um, is is a basic one: who uses the database and who can use it. Not enough people, I think, uh, but <laughs> it's a good problem with uh, delivering uh, passwords. We were hacked, you know, so it's, uh, I mean, we are really a low cost database. So, <laughs> and, and we are a total, uh, I'm a total disaster when it comes to marketing the, the database. So, uh, <laughs> uh, even the, the, the website is not as um, nice as it could be. I'm very much aware of that. Um, so who use it? Uh, Nargen Scholars, uh, we used it, um, some uh, development agencies uh, for some of the, re I used to be a Chatham House fellow, um, so we used it also for, for some of their reports. Uh, we used it for some of the reports, unpublished reports for the World Bank. Uh, for the, oh yes, there's also one for the French development agency on the um, crisis along, around uh, Boko Haram on the uh, crisis around the Lake Chad region. Um, I could put you a link, but I can't do that while I'm talking. Um, and um, so, yes, you, you have uh, different uh, users. Uh, I would say that today, maybe the majority are in Algerian. I, I never really calculated that. Um, yes, yes. Okay, that's, that's great. Um, I think and we're probably getting close to the end of our time. I don't see any other questions. Um, so I, I think what I'll, what I'll suggest is we close out. Uh, what I will say is that we'll, uh, we'll do a little bit of marketing for you the way we do with all of these, uh, these events. Uh, the video will be available on YouTube shortly once the Department of War Studies has done its magic. Um, and uh, and uh, I think the, the book, uh, your book on qualitative and quantitative methods, of course, it's something we want to call every student's attention to, every researcher's attention to. If you want to hold it up again, uh, just for the audience, then go ahead, a little bit of free publicity. And um, we can certainly include uh, a reference to that when we're uh, drawing attention to this, this talk as well. Uh, Conflict Records Unit, we deal with a lot of different kinds of um, sources and uses of sources and, and issues around the uses of those sources. Uh, and of course, as academics, we're, we're always interested in the, in the, uh, in the methodological uh, aspect of, of doing that kind of work. So this is, this is really interesting to me. I will definitely take a look at this as well. Uh, Vincent, Malcantoine, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I think we can probably, if you want to have the last word. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very thank much. You much. Yeah. You All much. right. Those are good last words. With thank that, you. thank you. And I'll stop yeah. the recording. Thank you. Have a good day, guys. Yeah.